Hello again. In the last video we talked about carbon dating and uh, how it was done originally. Um, now we have these uh, these devices called mass spectrometers or acceleration mass spectrometers and, and I'll describe how they work a little bit and uh, and how we can uh, with using a mass spectrometer we can use much smaller samples of the order of milligrams uh, in order to find out how much carbon-14 is left in that sample uh, rather than the traditional way which is measuring the activity of the sample um, so hence waiting for a, waiting for uh, atoms to decay uh, and, and that can take some time um, especially if you have a very small sample so um, uh, well, let's look at the mass spectrometer first. So imagine we have um, we have we have something that's of cultural or um, religious significance, uh, and and it's uh, and it's quite old. But we we want to determine how old it is. And in the last video, we we looked at a bone, um, and I guess that's the easiest thing for me to draw. Um, so we might have this bone. And this is a very small bone, and not only that, um, the archaeologists or the museum doesn't want to destroy the bone, doesn't want to grind it up and, and, and get the carbon out of it in order to measure a sample and measure how much it's going to decay. They only want to give you a very, very small amount of it, of the order of milligrams. So using a mass spectrometer, we can, um, we can, do, we, we can measure how much carbon-14 is in that sample very easily. A mass spectrometer... Uh, basically, uh, if you have a, uh, we'll call uh, this a carbon atom, okay, here's a carbon atom, uh, carbon atom, and we ionise it. So we give it some charge, and uh, uh, traditionally, or for the mass spectrometers, they always give it a positive charge. And they do that by knocking off electrons. It's very easy to remove electrons from this nucleus um, uh, to give it a, a net positive charge. And we need a positive charge, or we need some charge in order to use it in the mass spectrometer because the mass spectrometer is set up something like this. Um, it's an evacuated tube. And this is a very simplified diagram. And we take our carbon atoms, much smaller. Okay, and we vaporize that sample. So we have we have a, a very small stream of uh, of atoms being fired into this tube, and this tube is evacuated. So there's a there's a connection here that uh, goes off to a vacuum. And on the side here, around here, we have magnets. And for those say students that have studied electricity and magnetism, they will know that charged particles are affected by uh, a magnetic field. So we have a magnetic field passing between these two magnets here. And these, these may be strong magnets. Okay, but they're they're variable anyway. So, so this would be uh, essentially a, a coil of wire, and uh, by varying the uh, the current travelling through that wire, you could vary the magnetic field created by this, much like a solenoid. So variable magnetic field, and uh, these carbon atoms, these carbon ions. Um, from a sample containing both uh, uh, so both uh, C14 I'm going to fit that there and C12 from this sample are going through this tube now of course the only there's no, no difference chemically um, these both have atomic number six as, as far as their chemistry is concerned they're exactly the same and that's why uh, that's why carbon-14 dating works, is because living organisms take up the carbon-14 just as they would the carbon-12, uh, but um, different mass number, and um, that that's good in mass spectrometry because um, we can we can 
fire these carbon atoms through this magnetic field and depending on which one we're looking at carbon 14 or carbon 12 I know that curves not very good but you get the idea um, you can see that this uh, we have a variable magnetic field that they're going through. This is going to be the carbon-12 path and this will be the carbon-14 path because the carbon-14 has slightly larger mass and so uh, is, it, its path is not affected by the magnetic field as much as the carbon-12, the lower mass, the acceleration that uh, towards, towards the magnet at right angles to the magnet um, at every point of the carbon 12 is 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 much greater or or somewhat greater than it is the carbon 14 and so we have a detector down here um, and the detector uh, registers because we we've set those magnets up to to detect uh, carbon 12 we know its mass we know that we're expecting carbon 12 atoms to be reaching this detector considering that magnetic field and so um, we, we pass a, a certain amount of milligrams through this through this tube to the detector and we measure our carbon 12 then we use the same mass of our sample and we fire it through and we change the magnetic field such that the carbon 14 strikes the detector and so in doing that we can measure uh, so measure how much uh, carbon 14 is in the sample exactly and how much carbon 12 is in a sample exactly and we can get the ratio and so knowing how much carbon 14 is in there compared to the carbon 12 we basically have uh, exactly what we need in order to determine uh, how old this sample is um, so um, instead of waiting for the the activity of this carbon 14 to show up we can measure exactly how many carbon 14s compared to carbon 12 atoms there are and um, and of course uh, depending on if the sample was uh, 5730 years old then um, we would only expect to see half of the original value because that's the, the half-life of uh, carbon-14. So um, in that way we can measure uh, the age of this sample here. Um, I guess uh, the last thing I want to do is just do an example. Um, oh, and this is actually, uh, this is accurate to about, they say about 50,000 years. Uh, that's not a very good zero. 50,000 years. Um, and so uh, much better than uh, the 20,000 years using using the traditional method uh, by by measuring activity. So that's activity of the sample. That's uh, acceleration mass spectrometry, and uh, uh, so much more accurate. Um, can date back to a much uh, can date a much longer period a much larger age um, here's an example um, and this has nothing to do with uh, mass spectrometry but uh, this is useful for year 12 students in my class um, half-life of a particular radioactive source is 27 minutes a 10 grand sample of the source is observed to have an activity of 72 becquerels. The question is that calculate the initial time, oh, beg pardon, calculate the time it will take for the activity of this sample to decrease to nine becquerels. So um, this isn't too difficult a question, um, but it'll be good to see. Um, so 72 becquerels, okay. So we'll go back to our pen activity of 72 becquerels now and this will halve every half-life 
of course. So, um, 36 after one half life. Uh, I'll just represent it as T subscript half. 18 after two half lives. And of course, nine after three half lives. Um, so I think this might be obvious now. So um, therefore, um, the uh, the time it will take for uh, uh, time for the activity to re decrease to nine becquerels is three times twenty seven minutes, which equals. Uh, Oh, now I've done something wrong here. Can I delete that? Um, I'm get, just getting used to this calculator. Sorry. Uh, okay. Three times 27, wasn't it? And I should just be able to do that in my head, of course, which equals 81 minutes. Thanks for watching.